a very good morning to all of you in Singapore on this raining morning. If you're logging in from uh, other time zones, other parts of the world, good day to you or good evening. Welcome to this uh, new Education Normal webinar series organized by the Office of Education Research in the National Institute of Education of Nanyang Technological University. My name is uh, Luigi Kit. I'm a professor in NIE of NTU. Today's topic is a especially interesting and pertinent one. Uh, it's about uh, children's STEM learning at home. Uh, in these days where we have uh, social distancing, home-based learning, and when we have uh, vacations and uh, students have to stay at home at vacation because they could not travel, I think the notion of uh, informal STEM learning becomes uh, even more important, filling the gaps on how we might uh, help our students spend their time at home. So, uh, so uh, next slide, please. So uh, some logistics. If you have any technical difficulties uh, viewing this webinar, here's the email address. You can contact us. OK. Uh, and then this is the program for this webinar. I will introduce uh, our speaker very shortly. Uh, so uh, as you listen to the uh, webinar, and you think of any questions, feel free to type them on the Q&A function. Okay, so uh, let me introduce the speaker. So uh, it gives me great delight to introduce uh, Dr. Sherry C. Uh, Dr. C is based in San Francisco and she is speaking to us right now from there. Uh, Dr. C was our keynote speaker at the CTE STEM conference held about two months ago. And it, it is great to have her back to speak to us in Singapore. I think I first met Dr. C way back in 1999 at the CSCL conference held in Stanford University. Dr. C is a principal scientist with uh, BSCS Science Learning, a nonprofit organization that develops curricular materials provides professional training, and conducts research and evaluation in science and technology. For over 20 years, uh, Dr. C has brought her R&D leadership to the creative design and study of STEM learning applications through award-winning mobile apps, hand-on exhibits, craft-based STEM kits, and technology-enhanced curricula in design partnerships with K-12 teachers, science centers, after school programs and museums. Some of you may have visited the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Dr. C worked previously at the Exploratorium, as well as the University of California, Berkeley, Lawrence Hall of Science. Dr. C co-curated the Tech Hive Studio, a youth maker space and STEM project-based leadership innovation program. Dr. C has also worked with colleagues at uh, CU Boulder on paper mat mat matronics, a uh, paper craft based approach to creative engineering education. Most recently, Dr. C worked with the Concord Consortium Inspect project, where she researched the integration of IoT enabled sensors and computational thinking with science practices. So uh, let us in invite uh, Dr. C to talk to us about STEM learning at home. Dr. C, please. Hello. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here uh, to uh, give a seminar uh, today. Uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, a number of resources about informal learning. And I had changed my talk to be about informal learning, uh, not just about children, but also about family members, informal educators and teachers who also support uh, uh, educators as well, uh, uh, children as well. Uh, let me share my slides. Um, good. 
so the title of my talk is Supporting Informal STEM Learning at Home. Um, as Dr. Louis mentioned that it's uh, a lot of us are learning from home, not just for school, but also um, other activities as well. So before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge that the land that I live and work on in California is from the Mwekwa, Ohlone, and Chochenyo tribes. Uh, so an overview of my talk uh, is that uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my organization, BSCS Science Learning, because I think it might be a new organization to some of you. Uh, I will spend some time sharing uh, what is informal learning and what is informal STEM learning. I will also share a number of at-home resources that were developed during the pandemic uh, to address uh, COVID-19 uh, and science education. Uh, developed by BSCS and other institutions. And uh, given that the context of learning during the pandemic um, and many new models have emerged, um, I would love to be able to save some time for us to exchange our collective perspectives uh, on the new normal education. So a little bit about BSCS Science Learning. Uh, it, it, this is an organization uh, with its headquarters in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, its mission is to transform science teaching and learning through research-driven innovation. We have about 60 staff members uh, spread across the United States. Uh, I am in California. Uh, the staff members include science educators, uh, science teachers, education researchers, assessment designers, uh, curriculum developers, um, uh, as well as a number of different um, people that all together uh, develop uh, educational materials. And a little bit about the history um, of BSCS. So BSCS was founded in 1958 uh, with a grant from the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, to develop state-of-the-art biology textbooks for students across the country. And this was the same time that the United States also made several investments in physics and chemistry education uh, through just in general improving STEM education uh, because it wanted to maintain its sci scientific and technological um, competitive, especially after the launch of Sputnik. So BSCS offers a full year of biology program and it also included controversial topics like evolutionary biology and human reproduction. So 20 years later, uh, about 1975, 50% uh, of all high school students were using BSCS textbooks. And another 10 years later, uh, you may know or be familiar with this model is uh, the 5E instructional model, um, kind of in the late 80s was created which is the engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. Um, uh, it became a global standard for uh, science curriculum development and a, a model of inquiry. So today, BSCS is a leader in providing 21st century high school biology aligned to the next generation science standards. Uh, it's also an organization that cares very deeply about equity and social justice issues um, and has an equity and social justice initiative to ensure that the research and materials and programs are inclusive, uh, relevant, uh, and they're actively anti-racist and anti-oppressive in all its forms. Here you can see some pictures of the, of the textbooks, which includes student and teacher editions. So, in order to transform education, we recognize that meaningful and sustained change needs systemic interventions. So it isn't enough to work with one classroom and one teacher, uh, but if you really wanna see improvement, it needs to be supported by teacher change as well as organizational change. So thus, uh, BSCS works with groups at all levels of the educational system, 
from developing instructional materials, as I mentioned, textbooks and curricula, supporting teacher professional learning, as well as building the capacity of education leaders as well. And all of these uh, strands of work are all informed by research. So uh, there's too many programs uh, for me to um, include in this talk. So I, I picked a couple programs to share with you. Uh, one of the professional learning programs offered by BSCS is the STELLA program. Uh, STELLA is uh, a nationally recognized approach to teacher professional learning. And it uses uh, lesson study by using videos of classroom teaching um, to learn and analyze science teaching by focusing their attention on two aspects. Uh, one is examining student thinking and student ideas, and the other is looking at the curriculum or the science content storyline. Um, in viewing videos, uh, teachers look for evidence to support claims like, um, uh, Sherry doesn't seem to understand how plants use carbon dioxide gas during photosynthesis, or um, I noticed that question that that student asked was addressed in a particular way. So it's calling attention to uh, certain uh, aspects of teaching. Uh, the second example is uh, Open Syed. This is a free um, uh, curriculum, uh, which BSCS is a curriculum development partner. Uh, Open Syed is freely available middle and high school uh, curriculum that ex uh, exists to change the status quo. And it's trying to remove the predictability about who succeeds and who shows affection for, for STEM uh, fields. So each unit in Open Syed is uh, organized around um, an anchoring phenomena uh, and uh, using a storylines approach. So building this coherent sequence of lessons um, that are motivated by students' questions um, as they arise, as they're doing uh, investigations um, and from their interactions with a phenomena. Uh, I, I will be sharing later uh, some Open Syed uh, units, which um, have been developed uh, around COVID-19 for K-12 learners. And as I mentioned, all the units are freely available, so I encourage you to check them out. So a final example, uh, which is get moving kind of towards the direction of uh, my interest, is uh, uh, FieldScope, which is a citizen and community science program that engages participants of all ages to collect and visualize and analyze data uh, and FieldScope is the online platform to, to do that. And I will uh, spend some more time later in this talk uh, sharing some projects from that project, from that platform. Okay. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So, uh, one of the resources that BSCS offers is a collection of teaching videos. Uh, these are two to um, 10 minute long videos. And these are the same videos that are used in the Stella Teaching Professional Development uh, Program. Uh, and uh, the videos span different topics, uh, uh, including ways to support science and engineering practices, uh, and the videos come with many associated resources. Some of them are transcribed um, and uh, they include lesson plans and student handouts and other teacher materials. Um, the thing I really like about this uh, library of videos is that uh, you can search by topic, you can also search by grade band, and you can also search by the science and engineering practices or the phenomena. And so if you are an elementary school teacher and you are uh, teaching a particular topic, maybe the water cycle, you can find a video um, to look at. Now, it's important to recognize that these are not polished videos and exemplars of teaching. This is really a, a collection of resources um, and it's hard to judge teaching when you take someone's 
you know, classroom and only take a small segment, but it's meant as a professional development model to examine closely the teaching strategies um, and, and having conversations um, with other colleagues to understand, you know, did, what's the, can you identify the strategy which the teacher is engaging in and how might you bring that strategy into your own teaching? Uh, but I highly encourage you to, to look at these collections. Uh, I believe the subscription is um, open for the first six months um, that you sign up. Uh, so some of the units on Open SIA, the second project I talked about, um, uh, are uh, this high school unit, um, uh, which was done in partnership with BSCS Science Learning. Um, and it was developed with a scientist, an epidemiologist, and health uh, 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 public health experts. Um, and also, it was co-developed with equity and anti-racist education experts and community groups. Um, it addresses so social and emotional learning, um, which contributed to the materials development. Um, you know, as we know, uh, COVID was a very, uh, you know, and it's still ongoing, that um, in addition to the existing and systemic educational inequities, COVID-19 has really exacerbated the crisis um, disproportionately affecting uh, black and brown students as well as traditionally marginalized populations. And so these four units, um, they employ an inquiry-based approach and they focus on uh, key questions um, that family members uh, can um, together help answer these questions. Um, and it's designed, uh, it can be also used in the classroom for 14 to about 15 class periods of instruction uh, with different uh, extensions as well. Um, so some of the topics, let's say in the high school unit covers virus transmission uh, between people and communities uh, mitigation strategies using probabilities to explain how to lower the chances of transmitting COVID, um, looking at different policies and practices that affect and impact families um, and different people, and um, and also develops uh, social emotional competencies, um, self-awareness and social awareness. So I encourage you to check those out. Those are also available. Um, So um, up until now, I've been talking about uh, resources for professional learning and uh, instructional materials for K-12 classrooms. Uh, so why should we care about informal learning? Why should we care about all the time that a student doesn't spend at school? In 2004 through 2017, the U.S. National Science Foundation made a major investment to support a multi-institutional science of learning center to study implicit informal and formal learning from infants to adults. And what this diagram shows is the waking hours of someone's lifetime uh, from the time that they're born to the time that they retire. And in those 16 waking hours, what you can see in orange is that, uh, you know, they may go to preschool and, you know, attend kindergarten. And then through K-12, 18% of their waking hours are spent in school. They, a student may go on to college, may pursue a, a graduate degree, and then through work may have formal trainings as part of their um, the workforce development. And through retirement, they may take some uh, courses um, as well. But what you recognize is that there's all this other time in the blue uh, that could be spent uh, learning. And um, this is where informal learning operates. Uh, so, I want to invite you to answer this question. So, what percentage of fifth graders, uh, in the United States, fifth graders are usually 10 and 11 year olds, report being engaged in school? If you had to venture a guess. It's fun to see these polls. 
and the panelists and presenters are um, cannot participate in the poll, so we won't skew it in one particular direction. Looks like you have about 71% have participated in the poll. It'll be exciting to get to 100. Uh, when I used to uh, do survey studies, I was happy if I had gotten 30% response. This is just wonderful. Good, so I um, we can keep the poll, poll up, but it's looking like we have about, uh, some, some of you had said, uh, are other people able to see this, uh, the results of the poll as well? So I don't need to read it back. Um, but it looks like, you know, 75%, um, 30, a third of you had said about 75% and 44% uh, had said about 50. Good. Uh, so going on to my next uh, slide. So this is some data I'm sharing from a Gallup poll that was taken in 2016. That shows across the grades from fifth through twelfth grade what uh, percentage of students are engaged in school and what you notice is that there is a downward trend All right so um, I think some of you have predicted good percentage have predicted also you know about 75% of the students are engaged in school um, and 50. Some of you are a little, <laughs> are, are more realists, I think. Um, okay. So what I wanted to say, make the point is that, that uh, students, you know, w we might have a better chance of engaging and activating students' interests outside of school. And a child's attention is being pulled away to focus on other interesting pursuits. Um, and it's not surprising that we see many students leave school and make alternative choices for themselves and their attention. So we're going to my next slide. Um, okay, very quick second poll. We'll make this pretty quick. Um, so in the last seven days, I've learned so something interesting at school. Now I know a lot of you aren't in school, so just think of it as work also. You know, did you, did you learn something interesting at work? Do you agree, disagree, or are you not sure? And I know since all of you came to my seminar that you are um, interested and engaged learners, so we have already a biased population, but I appreciate you filling out the poll. Great, we have a lot, wonderful. Yeah, 74, 75% of people are reporting during the seminar that you have learned something interesting at work. We are, we are learners, that is, our, that is our super strength. So now looking at the data again from a Gallup poll from 2016, that the first question asked in the last seven days, I've learned something interesting at school. Uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have fun at school, which is in the green, and at school I get to do my best every day. And you know, while it starts high, it starts to really plummet again in a downward trend. So this is where I feel that you know, informal STEM learning, which is lifelong learning in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that takes place across a multitude of design settings and experiences um, outside the formal classroom. Uh, two wonderful books that are uh, from the National Research Council um, about informal learning environments. So, so just a couple of the features of you know, why we think inf informal learning is a great thing. Uh, these are places where they are object-centered, things like science centers, museums, art museums, the outdoors, they're object-centered, there's phenomena rich, where you can have meaningful conversations that are mediated by family members and objects um, in different communities. Uh, and these are, this, this often happens uh, in museums, but also in informal learning settings. Uh, when I was at the Lawrence Hall of Science, uh, I started a teen youth development program called the Tech Hive. And uh, in our work there, you know, we discovered that, um, and also by design, that these are places to develop STEM skills and also develop self-expression. Uh, this is a program that happened on Saturdays. Uh, interns would come in 
uh, on uh, the weekend on a Saturday and spend their time with us, helping to facilitate exhibits, uh, uh, talk to the public about science, and also develop media pieces um, with clients from the community. Um, you know, these places are also, from the program, fostering different STEM communities of practice where there are shared tools and practices and norms uh, of engaging with science and engineering practices. Um, it's a program that students could not just come in one Saturday, but multiple Saturdays, and students can also stay in that program, like school, um, for multiple years. So informal learning environments are also places to activate science interest. Uh, looking at you know, their fascination and curiosity and their persistence. And uh, a study done by my colleagues at the Lawrence Hall of Science uh, in collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh, um, youth who are activated uh, towards science learning are more likely to have an affinity towards STEM careers. So we see that you know, informal learning environments are great for engaging motivation, interest, and curiosity. Museums and science centers, as well as natural history museums and zoos, are incredible places for exploring models. You can take advantage of these large spaces by exploring huge physical models. Um, you can look at whale bones or different dinosaur bones and you know, maybe compare you know, the number of fingers that you have and the number of, of bones that you might find in a dinosaur. Um, at the Franklin Museum, you can crawl through a model of a heart and lots of adults still remember that, you know, the, all the different chambers that you can crawl through. Um, in exhibit at the Exploratorium, uh, you, you can, you know, dance around a, a, a vortex, all right, and, and understand kind of the shape of a tornado. But these are places that um, you can do in an out-of-school setting. Another great feature of informal learning environments is that you can learn by direct experience. Again, taking advantage of this large space is you can have multiple families coming together, learning and building with no particular agenda. You know, if they want some guidance, they can, but really it's, a, it's a, you know, expressing and building and making with different materials. And as we know from the pandemic, we don't necessarily need uh, physical materials as well. You can build and construct things online. So at Berkeley, uh, the there's a snap programming learning environment which is a block-based programming language there's a number of wonderful resources uh, thank you for sharing the link um, so using the snap environment you can learn you know computational thinking and computational practices but you can also use this environment to learn about science so um, I, I went and explored uh, snap recently and found that someone had developed a model of Snell's law. This is the, um, the law that um, looks at the angle of refraction of a beam of light when it hits a different material like water. Uh, another um, model uh, was both an engineering and medical model where uh, someone had programmed a way of uh, scanning a human body. And so kind of tying computation to uh, trying to build their understanding through modeling um, and programming. Uh, so just bringing a little bit of the research here is that informal learning are places, and formal learning environments are places where uh, you can spawn new communities. This is something that uh, my colleagues, uh, Leah Beakley and Ji Chi and others found in doing circuit stickers, as well as um, paper-based electronics, that there are people who are you're not your usual suspects of going into STEM education or showing an interest are engaging in these practices and materials and learning electronics. So these are incredible places to support that. Uh, informal learning is also places that foster lines of practice um, uh, and can develop your interests around specific hobbies. Um, and these are pursuits that happen over multiple years. Um, ch uh, children can also uh, express their science relevant curiosity. Um, a study that I did with Megan Luce um, by looking at uh, expressions of curiosity that children engaged in. 
But family members, as we know, are incredible resources. And uh, family members can oftentimes make the mistake of lecturing to their students or being the person who knows everything and is trying to impart knowledge, um, not to unlike a didactic classroom. But uh, with some slight shifts with different materials or cards or particular prompts, you can get family members to shift the conversation to be uh, a learning partner or a co-participant with their child uh, and their learning to um, elicit their student ideas um, their students ideas, uh, their child's ideas, um, uh, as well as uh, explore in different investigations by forming hypotheses, uh, carrying out experiments, whether or not you're at the beach um, or um, you happen to be at home and you're looking at some really moldy food, um, but there are different ways of doing that. Um, you, you can also find that uh, collaborative dialogue and scientific meaning making can also happen uh, in different places, in different languages. When you, when you, um, so I think the mis you you want to make sure that you don't uh, assume that someone can't engage, um, and uh, children can have very sophisticated ideas and engage in this collaborative dialogue. Yeah. Okay, one more poll, and then I will um, uh, move on to the next part of my slide. So I am curious that I realized that during the pandemic that it was difficult to visit museums, but thinking before the pandemic in 2019, maybe 2018, just pick a year, um, have you visited any of these places before? And you can check all that apply. So I feel like, a, yeah, it, it could be an informal, formal learning environment maybe, but maybe like informal science because I'm a science person. And if you've visited any of these places before. We have a lot of animal lovers, or maybe fish. <laughs> that's, what, that's great. I was thinking of botanical gardens uh, or an informal science center. Sometimes you see a technology museum. Sometimes there's a science festival of an outdoor table that you might walk up to and engage in some science. Oh, wonderful. We have a 78% of you reporting right now. Well, great. Well, across the board, we do have, um, looks like the highest number we have here are science and technology museums. They're near and dear to my heart. 58% uh, in zoos and aquarium and some sort of natural history museum. Uh, yes, natural history museums also include animals as well as um, nature and plants. So thank you. They aren't just um, specimens that have were long ago alive. So thank you for sharing that. Good. So just sharing the data, this was pulled from the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics in a survey of public attitudes towards um, understanding science and technology. And this is data that was pulled from 1981. We were all very young then, uh, to 2018. So about, um, uh, and if you look at this trend, you know, a little bit of a drop, but largely, you know, I would say very consistent with how how um, this audience is answering that. You know, we have visitation to informal science institutions and science and technology museums. In this particular data, it looks like there's lots of zoos and aquariums that are being, um, that people are participating in. So, you know, anywhere from, from about 50% to, you know, at least one in four, one in three are attending, which is great. It's just wonderful, because they are wonderful resources. Um, so just a quick summary of the features of informal learning environments is that they are curiosity and interest driven. Uh, they're multi-generational, right? involves grandma, aunts, uncles, caregivers. Um, it's embodied and interactive in these large spaces. It's very joyful and inventive, free choice. You can make these choices and voluntary and where you go and what you do. These environments are also social and collaborative. Uh, 
they often feature uh, cutting edge science and technology. I didn't share that as much in my examples, but uh, there are places that um, a whole network of museums that sh uh, like the NICE network that has been working on nanotechnology. Uh, science museums address things like genomics and stem cells as well. Uh, and things that, that you can uh, do kind of rapid programming on. Um, it's also an area where you can focus on uh, and include multi-sensory phenomena and of course media rich, right? Lots of um, movies, theaters, multimedia and, and images as well. So comes the bad news, right? So with COVID-19, what are we supposed to do now? This little bugger of a virus has really caused disruption. It's just incredible disruption, closing museums, closing schools, uh, really hampering one's ability to learn in all the ways I just described. So, you know, I'm not sharing anything uh, new here um, that you haven't heard before in other, uh, other t uh, seminars, but, you know, the COVID-19 impacts on learning uh, have widened the disparity in educational access. Um, we've gone into this panic crisis mode of putting together materials, and uh, unfortunately, that's narrowing the pedagogies to be more lecturing and content delivery, because that's what these systems you know, allow us to do in these online classrooms. Um, it makes it difficult to address social and emotional learning. Uh, learning tends to be very screen-based uh, and very limited in its uh, sensory learning. And, you know, hands-on laboratories have really taken a hit. Uh, it's very difficult to do, um, you know, authentic hands-on laboratories uh, during COVID. So as I was thinking about this kind of dismal situation that we're in, like, what can we do together to think about some solutions that could help us organize learning for this new normal that we're, we're facing? Like, how can we think about broadening educational access uh, in this time uh, and really working on creating equitable learning environments if we can? Um, an important value of informal learning is is being accessible to all learners from all socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and ethnic backgrounds. And is there an opportunity, since we are largely stuck at home, to take advantage of multi-generational learning and the way that informal learning has been supported? And, uh, you know, we have siblings, you know, rather than individual grades and classrooms, we have siblings together um, across grades. So maybe there's an opportunity for some collaborative inquiry um, pedagogies that we know are so powerful for learning. Uh, you know, what does place-based learning look like um, when we are in one place? Um, and are there ways that we can help support uh, social emotional learning and be attentive to multi-sensory learning? So these are sort of these design issues and as an education and learning uh, education designer and learning scientist, I've been thinking about this past you know eighteen months. Uh, so what I'd like to do now in the second half of my talk is uh, try to be hopeful and share some resources for at home learning. Um, I'm going to share some resources uh, that were created at BSCS Science Learning, but also share other resources and projects that I have worked on or collaborated on. Um, and these are all free resources that you can, um, you can get online or, or purchase online. Um, and then I'll end my talk with uh, some R&D projects that I'm working on now, and then open it up for um, hopefully a discussion that we can share our different perspectives. So the first resource I'm going to share uh, is uh, are four different activities one can do to be outside, to connect with nature. Um, and maybe it could be a plant in your office too, if you can't go outside to nature. Um, uh, but these are activities where uh, you, and it overlaps with kind of mindfulness training, where you can sit in a spot and do a quiet observation by yourself. Um, you may watch the sunrise or sunset, uh, you may take a phone, a compass with you, 
and orient yourselves towards the north or south or east west and basically um you could talk to a tree anyhow these are wonderful activities i encourage you to um to check them out Uh, the next project is a digital library project that uh, I worked on with my colleague Daryl Porcello, who is now at the Children's Creativity Museum, and Eric Marshall, who um, formerly was at the New York Hall of Science. And we aggregated a huge collection of resources that were either sitting in drawers um, in museums and science centers and created educational um, guides for them and uh, created a collection. Um, this includes uh, different featured science collections as well as at-home learning collections. And the important part about this resource is that they, uh, these resources were curated. And so there are tons of activities, but these focus on high quality science content um, and other criteria. So for example, um, you know, some general requirements is that the activities have to be hands-on and interactive. Uh, the activities uh, need to teach some sort of science, engineering, uh, or mathematics concept. Um, they need to be intuitive to use. This was a digital library designed for informal educators. Informal educators don't necessarily have the science background. They have may have lots of experience with kids, uh, but they, they are uh, uh, easy to use and e easy to navigate and adapt for whatever kids happen to show up in your environment. So it could be grandma um, or, or grandfather, and it could be um, you know, any family member. And the activities must also engage and motivate learners and stimulate curiosity. Uh, you know, the preferences for inquiry-based activities are highly encouraged. And the activities must also be developmentally appropriate for school-aged children and adults. Um, so you don't need a formal training in the STEM disciplines, but there's enough guidance in the activity that you could read it, um, secure the materials, and, uh, and deliver them. And a little bit about the How to Smile Digital Library metadata, because this is really where the innovation is, is you have to wind the clock back to 2007, back when um, you know, people were still just getting on board with online shopping, you know, with shoes and Amazon and so on. So we cataloged the activities using criteria which we received feedback from informal educators around what was useful to them. They wanted to know the material cost. How much does it cost per kid to run this activity? What's the age range? Um, I only have this much time, or what's the subject matter? And so these are all different kinds of metadata, including the informal learning category, resource language, which institution it came from. Maybe they had a preference for a particular, um, you know, they wanted to get things from uh, a girl serving program or from a science museum. Uh, and what's nice about um, How to Smile is that, you know, you find salt in your kitchen or a kiwi, you can enter that into your search and it'll generate activities as suggestions. Okay, so during the pandemic, um, the How to Smile team uh, uh, is embarking on uh, curating uh, a group of at-home activities right now. Um, these are low-cost everyday activities. Um, it provides guides for caregivers to work with children in meaningful ways. Um, it's particularly mindful of multi-sensory ways of learning and ways to practice their creativity. Um, I'm gonna move along pretty quickly here um, just so I uh, have enough time to get through my other materials, but this gives you an idea of, this is a draft framework um, that is under development, which lays out the criteria and the framework for curating and selecting these activities. Uh, so this is the fun part of my talk. Uh, I'm gonna share um, five exemplars fairly quickly here. Um, so in one activity called cutting pie, uh, you can basically take a plate and a piece of string and a pair of scissors and derive the value of pie. Um, the activity, you can find this activity on the Smile Digital Library and there's alignments to NGSS and ways to go further. Uh, another activity is called Tune Booster, which is from the Science Museum Group in London. And this is an activity where you can use your cell phone. Uh, and you place your cell phone in different bowls and see whether or not it amplifies the tunes or not. 
and you can uh, build different things with paper and explore different ways of amplifying a sound by cutting holes in jars and things. Um, this is an activity where you can take condiments out of your refrigerator and build a runway and basically do some viscosity experiments. Uh, this is a math activity where you, this is more for elementary school activity, this one, where you can take anything, it doesn't have to be food or M&Ms, but it's certainly fun for kids, and uh, paper clips that you talk about measure, measurement systems and how many units of something do you need in order to measure objects around you. And uh, this is an activity from the Tech Interactive in San Jose where you can take pieces of cardboard and basically build linkages uh, and build different craft projects. Um, this also comes with uh, different um, an activity PDF where you can imagine, explore, and iterate um, and going through different parts of the engineering cycle. Um, I particularly like this activity because uh, the museum had created TikTok videos, which um, was just so clever because it really uh, brought in uh, and, and was a medium familiar to informal educators, especially young people who are working with other children. Okay, um, Create at Home is another collection um, from the Children's Creativity Museum for younger children. Uh, there's a wonderful activity around journaling. Uh, uh, I encourage you to check this out about going out with nature. Uh, and then this is one activity I'd like to share and I probably won't be able to go through the whole activity, but this is a project at BSCS Science Learning called Invitations to Inquiry. And they're self-directed investigations that use maps and data to explore and identify patterns. So there's lots of different activities and it uses field scope platform to investigate data. So I'm gonna walk through one activity fairly quickly um, with an example of an inquiry activity. And note that this is something you can do in school, but you can also do this out of school as well. So the inquiry activity begins uh, by uh, having students turn and talk to their partner. And so if we had more time, I would have you turn to your partner and say, you know, what changes where you live tell you that spring is here? How do you know spring is here? And so you have a discussion and you talk about um, how do you know when fall is here? And what events do you celebrate at a specific time? Then in the uh, curriculum, uh, in a set of activities, then students watch a video clip of Rochester, New York about their Lilac Festival. And then they uh, gather more information by reading. So they add in reading to science. And then they watch a video of uh, a lilac bush, just one of them, time lapsing from January through May. And they have to make some observations. Um, Let's see, so this is the question for investigation, is when should our city host a lilac blossom festival? So not only do you say, well, this is where Rochester's is, but where does it happen in mine? And they look at data across the US of where these festivals, and this data is taken from the Bud Burst program, a citizen science program, where people report when blossoms are opening. Then as part of the sequence, um, students are asked, when should our city host a lilac blossom festival? Our own city in our own local context. So lilacs will be in full bloom. And so you have to make a prediction um, around these blooms. Uh, students explore data using field scope. This is not bud burst data, but I wanted to show you the different representations that you can uh, use within field scope um, with different uh, data that's plot on different maps um, and different ways of representing data and also with a mobile interface. So there are a ton of different activities that one can do um, uh, with field scope. I encourage you to check them out, including making night sky observations. So to try to finish off the sequence of this lilac festival of doing an investigation with data, uh, so then you know you can do this observation over a longer period of time or a shorter period of time. But as you look at the data, you have to question the quality of the data. And these are really data literacy practices. Like who, who collected that data? Um, when did they collect it? Um, you know, how is it measured? How is it sampled? 
And the data collection sheet provided here um, shows you kind of the first leaf, you know, when were the leaves unfolded, when did, you, when did you observe the first fruiting, and so on and so forth. And so you sort of see this arc of activity that involves conversation, um, examining data, um, making predictions, and engaging in science practices. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so invitations to inquiry is one of many resources for uh, uh, for educators, and I encourage you, I won't have time to go over these free COVID-19 resources from BSCS, but um, I encourage you, the link is in the chat, to go explore those as well. Um, okay. So uh, a couple more resources that I want to share with you. Um, the Global Alliance for Community Science Workshop, this is a, a, a network of as after school spaces or workshops in uh, California that, uh, that were founded by Dan Sujan at Mission Science Workshop. And their neighborhood spaces for STEM. And when you walk into these spaces, the first thing you notice is the smell, right? They do taxidermy, their bones and fossils, there's art supplies, exhibits and machine tools, and they have drop-in programs as well as uh, provide after-school programming uh, for schools, as well as they mentor youth and teens um, in this work. Um, another kind of just really wonderful example of an informal STEM learning environment. During the pandemic, because the workshops were forced to close, that their pivot was to take their hands-on activities and to create these lunch bags. And schools who had a free lunch program where families were either going to the school to pick up lunch could also pick up a bag of supplies. And uh, they did this for 52 weeks during the like whole year during the pandemic uh, throughout the summer as well and distributed about 60,000 kits. But it's really quite an incredible model because they are low cost materials that have really compelling science um, behind them, science and engineering. Um, when just more recently, as the as you know, we've been able to do social distancing, they've also set up tents where um, members of the community, when you're not in school, can go in and um, interact with um, different activities as well. I want to share just a couple activities. In this network, there is a workshop in Watsonville, which is an uh, agricultural area in California. Uh, there's one in San Francisco, uh, Mission Science, as well as Excelsior in San Francisco, uh, Fresno, um, a bunch of different places. But um, I'm pulling a couple activities across these. And so using a hobby motor, uh, you can make a car, you can make you know, an exhibit, basically a, a tornado, uh, you can make a bubble, so it's it's not uh, you know one thing that you can make. You're making something that then becomes a toy that you can play further, which is really the power of this model. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to my colleague Kurt Gabrielson, who wrote up a lot of the community science workshops. Um, I actually have the book here in front of me. I can show from the community science workshop in a book called Tinkering, and then he um, moved to East Timor or. Um, Timor Lest and uh, brought a lot of the inspirations uh, working in the jungle to using kind of lower cost materials in these, but definitely wonderful things to check out. So I have about two more slides um, to get through. I know um, we just have a little bit of limited time here. But so those are projects that have already been done. The activities are available. I encourage you to go get them. Um, I'm going to talk about two very briefly research projects, one which I'm working on right now, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation uh, Computer Science for All program, which is developing materials for uh, underrepresented youth to uh, help teach them computing concepts. And this past summer, we ran an online camp, and that was incredibly eye-opening for me, um, where uh, we did very similar things like CSW where we prepared materials and we either mailed them to families or families came by to the university at Georgia Tech with my collaborator Henju Oh 
um, and pick them up and then we ran an online camp and the reason this camp worked well uh, one is because that we leveraged online systems like the uh, circuit playground express uh, uses make code um, also the micro bit uh, also uses MakeCode online, and so we were able to do some programming and share screens, but they were also able to do these tangible things as well um, and build out projects. Um, this is a project where they used different cards that were basically sensors that were exposed um, to show how we unblacked box the computing, and then they were asked to uh, create a message uh, in a project uh, using these components. You know. A message that they would create on their own. Um, this one was a dog adoption center where uh, they wanted to um, help uh, dogs find um, a home and the lights would indicate the um, kind of amount of donation you would make um, towards this, um, this organization. But um, TBD, um, we're analyzing the data right now and hopefully we'll be writing a paper about this work. Um, the second example I wanna share is from my colleague, Charles Shi, who is at the Institute for Future Intelligence. And with the FLIR-1 camera, one is able to do some really incredible science experiments. So he is really pushing this idea of a telelab of a remote laboratory where using internet of things uh, and control that you can um, be able to kind of submit and crowd, um, uh, take pictures and submit them but also be able to uh, remotely control instruments to also um, participate in science laboratories and another resources to check out. So um, I'll just to wrap up here. My learning goals for today for you was I was hoping that you would gain a familiarity with some of the work of BSCS science learning and hopefully have a greater appreciation for informal science learning um, especially informal STEM learning in the overall ecosystem of a science education. And uh, I wanted to um, provide new knowledge and resources to add to your toolkit. I hope I was able to do that. And to reflect on how science education will need to be transformed in this new normal education um, in the near and far future, um, you know, during and after COVID-19. So some concluding thoughts. Um, uh, the seminar has really given me a chance to do uh, you know, some wonderful reflection about what we can do now and going into the future. And you know, my observations are that, you know, I think we've learned a lot about hybrid learning and I don't think it's going to go away. It's gonna stay and that parents and caregivers um, play a major role uh, in uh, and responsibility in facilitating the learning um, at home. And uh, informal science institutions, you know, even when they were closed, are incredible resources for STEM learning and teaching. And this was possible because a lot of uh, infrastructure and digital libraries and digital media uh, was leveraged, you know, including um, video-based tutorials, and uh, that in general we need to reverse the trend in science education and kind of bring more joy uh, and build stronger connections across schooling um, and informal STEM. So I feel like, you know, when schools and informal STEM can be closer together, uh, you know, they can build these synergies um, as part of this education ecosystem to support learners, especially during the pandemic. And this is really an opportunity to continue addressing and improving issues of equity um, as, we, as we've seen that um, the pandemic's been very hard for um, uh, children and families. So with that, I will end my talk and uh, feel free to contact me. And I want to thank you for um, coming to my seminar. And uh, I think we, I don't know if we have any time for questions. I'm sorry if I uh, ran over here. Yeah, I think we have some time for questions. Uh, so, audience, feel free to post your questions to the Q and A function. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you, Doctor C, for the most informative talk. And, uh,
activities, uh, resources for informal STEM learning. As I listen, I, the, the chat keep popping up lots of URLs to, to access. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, maybe too many, but... Um... <laughs> so the, the, the audience would like to have the list and I will try to make it available for them. You know, I think there's so, as, as yeah. one hand said, they are so, so uh, doable. So uh, I think we raise awareness that there are good resources out there from BSCS and uh, other entities that we can tap on to <laughs> further informal science learning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like the, the that this is just a, you know, toe in the water is just the first activity, but really learning how to facilitate them, facilitate them well in a way that really engages students and continues that inquiry and really listens to their ideas. Uh, you know, whether or not they are, you know, misconceptions, we want to listen to students' ideas and start from where their thinking is. And I think that's a really important practice um, to do. So yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming to my talk. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Not making it for Sherry C, but very uh, uh, enlightening talk, lots of resources, activities. I think you will rush them, uh, search them yeah. out, and <laughs> see whether you can uh, enact them in our own uh, homes or playgrounds. Yeah, so thank you very much. and. Uh, uh, thank, we thank the audience for coming for this session and uh, yeah, so look, see you in the next uh, webinar and uh, Sherry, thank you very much indeed. So it is, uh, it is Monday night for you, right? So we hold you up for your <laughs> Monday evening. Yeah. Thanks, very good. So yeah, thank you very much for spending your Monday evening with us. Yeah. So.